So, I'm Gary Nuttall. Um, it's often said these days, if you say the word blockchain and insurance three times, I will magically appear. Uh, because I've been fascinated by both the insurance industry for many years and blockchain and what's going to happen when we bring it together. So just before we start, um, quick question from the audience. Who actually works in insurance here? Most of you, okay. And how many of you are employed by insurance? Is it the rest of you and you don't actually work? Okay, right, and who, who are the technical people? Okay, a few. And who has shares? ISAs, pensions, okay. Who's got crypto? That's interesting. So over half of you have got cryptocurrency, and it looked like about a third to a quarter of you have got pensions or ISAs. So I'll try and tailor this accordingly in some way. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. So some news, first of all. Um, London insurance market, you know, it, it's got proud history, over 300 years old. The two major things that have been happening of late is last year they banned drinking alcohol during the day which is very sad indeed. Um, but the most important thing was the announcement earlier on this week that they have decided to adopt computers. So at long last, uh, the London insurance market is joining us in the 20th century. And so the hope is that we're using blockchain, we'll bring them into the 21st century. So go on to the next slide. Um, that's not actually to be critical about them because having worked at a SEBSAs in the insurance market with, with Lloyds and so on, I know just how challenging it is to get people to change their processes, and a lot of their systems are paper-based. You know, and th this is the thing that where I've spoken with startups who are saying, oh yeah, we're doing AI or we're doing blockchain, it's gonna revolutionize insurance. And you say, well, how's that gonna work with paper policies? And they go, sorry, what do you mean paper policies? It's like, well, most policies are written on paper. 80% of business in London is renewal-based. And so it's just on paper, on paper. So the really good thing about the announcement earlier on this week for Inga Beale, in all due credit, is the very fact that it is digitizing this marketplace at last actually means that we can do things like use blockchain and so on. So we go on to the next slide. So blockchain, who knows about blockchain already? Hands up. Okay, so for those who didn't put their hands up, if you still don't understand what I was talking about afterwards, go and seek someone who held their hand up before, and they can explain it in a different way to you. The way I describe it, it it's, a, it's a protocol. A protocol is simply a way of doing stuff. It's how you transact in business or social or technology. See, we've now got the hand movements as well. That's really good. And if we, if we look at three other three protocols that have happened over the years, and I know the techie people get really, really bored by this, but who knows what TCP IP is? Okay. Who knows what the internet is? Okay. So this is the thing, and it's the same with HTTP. Anyone know what HTTP is? A few. Who knows what the World Wide Web is? Loads, yeah. So this is a key thing about blockchain. It's a protocol that in a few years, no one will even think about. They'll just be using it as a matter of course. So if we go on to the next slide, in fact, so yeah, it's the internet, it's the World Wide Web, and it's what's also known as a distributed ledger for blockchain. Going on to the next slide, the, the three evolutions there is that the internet allowed us to share data. And then the World Wide Web allows us to share information. The transformational thing about blockchain is it allows us to transfer value. So not copy value, but actually transfer it without an intermediary. So you know, people go, well, I can do that with PayPal at the moment. You go, no, 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 I mean you can transfer value without even using PayPal. And that makes it truly transformative in many ways. <laughs> so in 2008, coming up to the 10th anniversary now, there was this mystical figure, Satoshi Nakamoto, he, they, she, whatever, produced a paper. And it was the beginning of the, the blockchain protocol where they were talking about a new electronic payment system that, you know, effectively, it was a kickback against the banks in 2008 where there been the crisis and so on. However, it's not all about Bitcoin. Anyone know the current price of Bitcoin at the moment in dollars? Go for it. 8,100, so I reckon that's within the last 60 minutes you checked up on there. Is that right? Maybe, yeah. So B B Bitcoin's really fascinating because it raises a lot of publicity, gets a lot of promotion, you see it in the news a lot, 
But good enough, more and more now, press people are beginning to say Bitcoin oh, and the underlying protocol blockchain. And so it's getting a bit of press on there. But blockchain is not all about Bitcoin. It's, it's many other things as well. And if we work out what, why it's called blockchain, it's simply because of how the data is stored. If you think about an old paper ledger where you write in transactions in it, and at the bottom of the page, you do a little bit of mathematics. And that mathematics is called a cryptographic hash. And it's unique. It means if you change anything on that page and redo that hash, it'll come up with a different number. So it's like a unique digital signature that guarantees the authenticity of that page. And then you carry that hash and put it onto the next page, do all your transactions, and at the bottom of that, do another cryptographic hash. And all this means is that you're building up blocks of data which are chained together, hence the phrase blockchain. Everyone feel a little bit easier about that now? Good. Go on to the next slide. What we also do is, as well as having this ledger where it's all, everything's chained together, is we give everybody involved a complete copy of it. Now, this does vary from blockchain protocol to blockchain protocol. Um, but with the traditional ones, the, the early ones, this is certainly the way it works. So it means that everyone has got an identical copy. And that's really, really powerful. So we go on to the next slide. Because what you can also do, and this is what I was doing in the London insurance market, is that you can actually have limited access. You can, only, you can grant access to certain people if you so wish. So in the London insurance market, where you've got Lloyd's registered brokers and Lloyd's registered under, um, saying undertakers then, underwriters, Maybe I'm talking about the demise of an industry a little bit too soon. Um, then you, you can have this as a closed system, so everyone's like effectively a member, and that's what's known as a private permission ledger. If you want to open it up, however, which is how Bitcoin works, you can have it completely open where everyone can plug in, and everyone's still got a copy of all of the data. Now, what that leads to is it means that effectively we've got what's known as a database. Has anyone heard of those before? Yeah, it's nothing new, really. And this is the awesome thing about blockchain. Blockchain actually is nothing new. It's just a recombination of existing technologies, such as databases, such as cryptography and, and security and so on. But what it does mean is it provides a complete audit trail of every transaction that's ever happened. And the really powerful thing, you know I said that everyone has a copy of exactly the same thing. What that then means is that I know that you know that I know that everything's the same, that they can see and I can see. And that, that's remarkably powerful when you actually think it through, because it stops fraud and it stops people trying to fiddle the system. Um, it also means, because you've got the one copy that everyone has access to, in effect, there's no need for reconciliation. Who here, um, their organization's really good at reconciliation? Adequate at it? Does it sufficiently? Yeah. The, the thing about reconciliation is it's an overhead. It doesn't give you any competitive advantage at all. It's a cost. And so the great thing about distributed ledger and blockchain is it can reduce that cost. And we might talk about that on one of the panels later. Uh, it's highly distributed, which means it's resistant to cyber attack. Um, and it's cryptographically secured. So we take a look at the, the use cases. They broadly fall into four areas. Um, as a ledger, which is where you maintain a register and effect of ownership of, of goods in some way. Um, as a cryptocurrency, which, you know, Bitcoin is the, the big one around that. Um, it's being used increasingly around identity management. So um, in Estonia, for example, that the government adopted the e-registry scheme to put all of their citizens on a blockchain. And programmability, you'll hear probably the worst named phrase ever of smart contracts. So I keep saying they're neither smart nor contracts. Uh, they are, in fact, a thing. Has anyone heard of computer programs? Yeah, well, that's what smart contracts are. Um, but they allow you to do some quite clever functionality. So we go on from there. Um, to close this down, you know, how does this apply to insurance? Well, here's just some of the examples of what's going on in the insurance marketplace at the moment, where there's a whole number of companies. You know, we've got um, the big players like Allianz, like Mir, Maersk, uh, sorry, Amlin, Catlin, and so on. And we've got a couple of people from the panels on that later as well. There's a whole number of insurance companies who are already exploring this technology and beginning to deploy it. So with that, I think that's the last slide. Unless there are any questions, I'll hand on to the next person. Great. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>